Amen. And get ready for the preaching of the word of the Lord. Hallelujah. So glad you're here this morning. I greet all of you in the name of Jesus. Welcome you to the Church of Omaha. If it's your first time, let me just echo what Pastor Jack said and welcome you. We're glad you're here and glad that you have chosen uh, to be with us and worship with us this morning. Do want to meet you and get to know you. Hopefully we'll connect with you in the guest room after. Amen. Amen. I also just want to tell you, if you need a Bible this morning, we have Bibles and uh, just see Pastor Jack or Sister Chris, and we can get you a Bible. We want everyone to have the Word of God in your own hands, able to read it and, and to pray it and to study it and to love it. Amen? Praise God. If you have your Bibles, I would invite you to join me to the book of Nehemiah chapter 8. If you don't have your Bibles, still join me. It's going to be on the screen. And let's stand for the reading of the Word this morning as we open it to uh, share it with you. Hallelujah. I do want to mention, uh, while you're getting there, getting it ready and following along here in just a minute, um, I will not be here tonight. Uh, That's because I will be uh, over in uh, South Omaha, actually right on the border of Bellevue. Uh, We have a new church that has uh, uh, been here for a while, and they've just recently uh, transferred into uh, our faith and our affiliation, and I'm going there. I'm the presbyter uh, of this uh, section, this region, and I'm going there for some paperwork, and as well, I'm going to be preaching uh, there tonight, but uh, we have a missionary coming tonight, Brother Eichert. Those of you that were here at the uh, Music Fest, Brother Eichert was here. In fact, we took him on as a missionary, and are, we're going to begin supporting him financially and with our prayers. So I invite you to come back tonight and, and worship and love the Lord and hear his testimony and uh, what God is doing there. Uh, I'll tell you something that was awesome. Friday night, they needed just five more uh, PIMs, that's Partners in Missions, people to partner with them financially. And all five were raised while we were here, and they're going back to the mission field very shortly. So isn't that wonderful? Amen? <laughs> Hallelujah. So come tonight and, and uh, worship the Lord, and I, I might get back as, as the tail end of service is going, unless you guys just shout and dance for a good hour and a half before he preaches, but uh, I will hope to see you after tonight a little bit there, but uh, please come and be a part of it. Pastor Jack, Pastor Lucas, Pastor Everett will all uh, be helping to run the service and take care of anything that needs to be taken care of. Nehemiah chapter 8 and beginning at verse number 1. And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate, and they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women and all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. And he read it, excuse me, he read from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform that they had made for the, for the purpose. And beside him stood, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce all these guys' names, okay? We'll just say a good pastoral team. There we go. Amen. Verse 5. Uh, and Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. That doesn't mean that he was proud. It just means he was on a platform like I am here now. Okay, He was above all the people, and as he opened it, all the people stood. Verse 6, And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. And also, all this wonderful pastoral team, the Levites helped the people to understand the law, while the people remained in their places. They read from the book, from the law of God, clearly And they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. Now, I'm going to go to Psalm 122, verse 1. Amen. I agree with this psalmist, and I can't wait to meet the they he was referring to. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Amen. Is anybody glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Hallelujah. (laughs) Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. And for just a little while this morning, I want to preach on this subject, this title, Get Your Mind on Jesus, Let's Have Church. (laughs) Hallelujah. Turn to your neighbor and just tell them the title. Get your mind on Jesus, Let's Have Church. (laughs) Praise God, praise God. 
Amen. And you may be seated in the name of the Lord Jesus. I love being the church. And I love being the church 24-7, 365. In other words, every single day, I love to be the church. Whether I'm shopping or whether I'm driving on the highway or whether I'm at home or whether I'm at the store, it doesn't matter. I love being the church. But that being said, I also love coming to church and worshiping the Lord in spirit and in truth. There's something about getting together with God's people. There's something about getting together with members of like precious faith who love the word of God, who love the name of Jesus, who worship him in spirit and in truth together. There's something about that corporate worship when we get together and begin to praise him and begin to declare his wonders. Anybody can testify this morning that you love being at church, that you love having church. Anybody here glad to have a place where there's fire and anointing, where there's power in the spirit of God, where it's not just enticing words of man's wisdom, but it's a demonstration of the spirit and power of God. Amen. I'm going to tell you something. Dead church is an oxymoron. Amen? I, I, don't, I don't believe we should ever have a, a, a normal service. I am of the mindset that every time we come together, whether it's a Sunday morning, whether it's a Sunday night, a Wednesday night, a a life group, whether it is a revival, we need to have a Holy Ghost move of God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Does anybody love having church? Well, let me give you just a real quick overview of Nehemiah and, and catch especially our guests up here and some of you that may have not been here at the top of the, this series back in September, but let me just real briefly run through this real quick. And, and by the way, today our buy into the word is going to help support our young people. If you want to help give, amen, go ahead and bring it up and just throw it in. It's going to help support our young people going to North American Youth Congress. By the way, let me just interject. This is, this is you know, we interrupt this message to bring you this, this announcement. North American Youth Congress is the premier event for our young people of the apostolic Pentecostal faith. This year, in less than 24 hours of them opening the registration, 18,000 people signed up. They sold out. They had to do an overflow of 4,000, and that's already sold out. So don't tell me this generation doesn't want apostolic revival. Don't tell me this generation doesn't want a move of God. Don't just write them off. Their music might sound a little bit different than yours did in your generation. But this young, these young people that are downstairs right now, they love God. They love this message. And they're going to feel that Chesapeake Arena to its fullest extent this year, praising and worshiping the Almighty God. So I believe that's something worth supporting. I believe that's something worth buying into. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. And now we return you to your regularly scheduled message. Thank you. Real quickly, let me just let me run through Nehemiah. Beginning at chapter 1 through where we are right here. Nehemiah has asked about Jerusalem. He's prayed and fasted. He's been burdened by God and he's gone and taken action. Once he arrived there, he prayed some more. He cast some vision and the work began. The remnant unified together. They worked hard together and completed the walls in 52 days. In, in spite of all the fighting and the battling that was going on from the enemy. Then he enlisted leadership and citizenship was established and worship was encouraged and a reckoning of God's word took place separating those who had not ensured their heritage and an, in, their inheritance as an Israelite. Now, that's just a huge, quick summary of, of chapters 1 through 7 and now we're here at chapter 8 in this message today. The people of God are about to learn something about worship inside the walls of separation and inside the gates of protection that cannot and do not and will not happen anywhere else. Now remember, it's been almost 100 years, almost an entire century since they have experienced true worship. They've lived among ruin and rubble. They've had a temple, but no real commitment and covenant with God. And this remnant's first church service, if you will, it didn't take place inside the temple. 
Oh, for those of you that might understand some of the uh, law and the way things worked, uh, this was a big step. This was a paradigm shift. Something wasn't happening inside the temple. Something was happening outside the wall of the temple. The walls and gates were uh, finished. They felt secure outside. They didn't have to be inside and, and feel like they couldn't really worship like they wanted to. Hear me, we don't understand that because we don't understand the law, number one. And I'm, I'm not saying it rudely. I, I, I was studying. I didn't understand it. I've never been in a foreign country uh, where, where, they, where they manipulate and where the government uh, keeps you from worshiping and, and have to pray and worship underground and quietly. I don't know what I would do in some of those countries. I don't know if I could contain myself. I don't know if I could be quiet enough when the Lord moves upon me. But some of these do. Some of our Christian brothers and sisters throughout the world, they have to be very secretive about their faith. And it's not because they're afraid of the gospel. It's because they're afraid of being killed. And, and so you can imagine that, using that as a kind of a, a reference point, imagine here's what's happened. The walls and gates have been rebuilt now, and there's a feeling of safety and security, and they can worship freely. Mm, don't miss the point. If there are no lines of separation, if there are no lines of demarcation, you will be oppressed and unable to worship both inside and outside. Israel had been oppressed by the enemies of God. They had rebuilt the temple as a place for worship, but there was no evidence of it, outside or in it, until the walls and the gates were rebuilt and repaired and reinforced. If there's no, hear me, I, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. If there's no difference in your lifestyle and the lifestyle of the unbeliever, you won't be able to worship the way you want to. Not only do you need to be filled and refilled with the Holy Spirit, but you need to make sure that you have walls and gates securely in place so that you can worship Him. If there's no separation, then there's no protection from the world. If there's no protection, then there's no true worship in spirit and in truth. And remember this, I've been saying it for the last few weeks in this series, you cannot worship God the way you want to you must worship him the way he wants you to. You've got to come to him on his terms. And it's not to try to say he's a mean, ugly God waiting to just bean you on the head. No, but he sets forth a protocol. He sets forth an order, and you cannot violate that order. You can't come on your own terms to God. You've got to come on his terms according to his word. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Worship had been confined uh, to the temple prior to the completion of the walls and gates, but now that there was a clear line of separation that was made between God's people and their enemies and the world, worship, watch this, became a lifestyle. It became more than just a ritual practice. It became more than just something they did once a week or twice a week. It now was going to become a lifestyle. Let me tell you something this morning. Now, if you're a guest here, if you're, if you're a, a new believer here that's just starting out, then this doesn't apply to you, so you can turn your ears off and think about lunch for a minute. But those of you that have lived for God any length of time, I know we struggle sometimes. I know we face our own valleys sometimes. But we need to have an altar experience, a prayer experience, a, 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 a come to meet in Jesus experience before we get to church because when we come, we need to bring that anointing presence of God with us. Some people are just waiting for church to happen so they can get what they need. Maybe if we got a kingdom alignment with God in prayer before church happened on Sunday, we might have better church. Sometimes we wait for the choir or the praise team to get us warmed up, or we wait for the preacher to get to the good part. I'm going to tell you like Jeff Arnold, it's all good. There is no good part. When I started preaching, it was good. And I'm not saying that to be rude or arrogant. I'm telling you because I'm preaching the word of God, it's good. We need to get into it because it's good. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let the scoffers and let the naysayers accuse me, accuse us, accuse apostolics of being legalist because we delineate between right and wrong. Because we delineate between male and female. Because we delineate between the truth and the lie. Go ahead and let them call us legalists. Let them proclaim that living this apostolic Pentecostal lifestyle is restrictive. 
I know this, the borders and boundaries serve to keep me secure from the enemy. But more importantly, they please God. (laughs) No matter how much the so-called charismatic emergent Christian wants to claim we're restrictive or or legalistic, when you show them Nehemiah chapter 8, their argument falls flat. They can't prove it by the Bible because of what the word of the Lord says. For only after the walls and gates were rebuilt and repaired and reinforced could true worship resume in Jerusalem. Let me have your attention this morning as I preach and teach to you about the benefits of boundaries and borders. I've already told you that it pleases God and it protects you from the enemy, but today I've got some good news for you. That's not all that these borders and boundaries do. In fact, that's just the beginning of what the borders and boundaries do in your walk for God. If you will live for God, here's what will happen. Put up the screen that says three things. The first one, it'll produce three things in the church. Number one, unity. Number two, revival. And number three, true worship. If we will put God first, if we will build the boundaries and the borders, if we will make them secure and have those marks of of, of demarcation and separation, worship will be restored and we'll feel protection from God, but also we will have unity, revival, and true worship. I don't know about you, but I want that. I don't know about you, but I desire that. Does anybody want real God sent unity? Does anybody want real revival? I'm not talking about a flash in a pan. I'm not talking about a couple of goosebumps. I'm talking about a holy revival that gets a hold of your heart, that changes people's lives, that delivers them from the drugs and the world and the sin. I'm talking about a revival that closes down houses of ill repute and bars. I'm talking about a revival that shakes the foundations of the community. I'm talking about a revival that moves from the White House to the penthouse. I'm talking about a revival that goes from the gutter to Main Street. I'm talking about a revival that reaches the rich and the poor. That reaches everyone in between. I want that. Hallelujah. But let me first talk about unity. Wow. Woo. Number one, unity. There's a screen, I think, that that just has that on it. Brother Josh, if you'd put that up. There you go. Thank you. Let's talk about unity for a minute. The first one. We want all three, but I want to talk about each one just real quickly here. Nehemiah 8 verse 1 says, And all the people gathered as one man. Everybody say, as one man. Notice they gathered into the square before the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. Now, again, note that phrase, as one man. This was a unified effort. Pastor Jack, can you come here real quick? I want to show you something here. The Bible talks about not being unequally yoked. Pastor Jack and I, give or take, are about the same height and, and build and all. And so we're somewhat equally yoked. Now, if we're unified... We're going to go in the same direction, right? And, and, and two are better than one and so forth. But if we're not unified, and, and Jack wants to go that way and I want to go this way, it, it's not going to work, is it? Or, or if I'm trying to, it, go ahead and sit down for a minute. If, if, if I'm trying to get Jack to help me to, to work, but he doesn't want to, you know, it, come on. You know. It's going to be something like that, right? A struggle, like, you know? But this was as, they didn't come separate. They didn't come with their own agendas. They didn't come, uh, you know, with, with thinking about what they're going to have for lunch. They didn't come, you know, with other, you know, thoughts. on their, They came as one man. They came unified. You see, <laughs> the product of getting those walls and gates secure. The product of enlisting leadership and and, and establishing all of the citizenship and all that took place in chapter 7. Now, unity takes place. And as one man, they come to church. Woo! I was glad when they said to me, let us go. You know, the Bible tells us to serve the Lord with gladness. This is what some of us do. Praise the Lord. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I know. Well, you know, 
No. Serving with glad. Do you think that in the Bible when, when the psalmist said that, that, that they never had any bad days? That they never had any bad things? In it? No, of course they had stuff going on. Of course they had negativity in their life. Of course they had problems that they had to face and deal with. But there was something about serving him that said, you know what? This has a higher purpose. This, in fact, let me, let me just tell you something here. Did you know God's purpose for you takes precedent over your problem? Let me prove it. Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for the good to them who are the called, according to God, to them who uh, love God, right? Who are the called according to his purpose. We're like, God, I'm dealing with this problem. My purpose for you takes precedent over your, it doesn't mean he doesn't care. I'm not trying to suggest to you that God doesn't care about what you're going through. Remember a few weeks ago, I preached you God is in trouble. He is, he's right there with you. But his purpose for you takes precedent over that problem. He's working something in you. Mm, my, 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 my. Now, unity. Let, let, me, let me show you. How many of you, well, I shouldn't probably ask that because I know some people have have had problems with their physical, their biological family. Um, but many of you, most of you, hopefully, have, have had a somewhat good experience with family members and brothers, sisters, moms, dads, and all that. I really, some of you may have not, and, and, and you know, I do apologize for your, the hurt you've been through. But let me just say something for a minute. Regardless of the experience you've had with your earthly and biological family, you're going to live with the family of God for eternity. So we might as well just get used to being together down here, worshiping together down here, being in unity down here. We might as well just get the grudges and, and leave them at the altar. We might as well get the chips off our shoulder. That's not where they belong anyway. And we might as well just live together and serve together and love God together. Amen? Well, let me, let me tell you about some together in the Bible. I'm going to run through these fast, Brother Josh, so flow with me here. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. Watch this. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. God never intended for you and your immediate biological family to be the only source of true spiritual fellowship in your lives. In fact, I'll go on record as saying to you today that you are incomplete if you are disconnected from the body of Christ. Don't make the mistake of rebuilding the walls and the gates as something to isolate yourself from others. That's not what I'm talking about. Those walls and gates didn't isolate them from others. It isolated them from the enemy. It protected them from the enemy. It served as separation. It served as demarcation. But it wasn't so that I could build a wall up and I'm never going to talk to Pastor Jack anymore because he offended me. No, I'm not talking about those kind of walls. We need to tear those walls down. We need to go when we bring our gift to the altar and if I've got a problem with Pastor Jack I need to leave it at the altar go and deal with it man to man face to face Christian to Christian and then come back and bring my gift to the Lord that's Bible amen if you're blessed to have a good relationship with your family thank God for it but remember this the body of Christ is your eternal family and God gave you the church to strengthen you you need the church, and I would submit to you, the church needs you. If you think you can get along without a church family, and then you can throw away literally Romans to Revelation. You don't need that. In fact, throw away the book of Acts, too. You don't need that either. In fact, you might as well just burn the Bible. You don't even need that. In fact, did you know there are uh, numbers? It is, it's, a, it's over 100 uh, uh, commandments in the New Testament that you can't keep unless you're a part of a body of believers. God called a church family. Now while he calls individuals to do things and, and, and to serve in certain areas, he calls the church family. This thumb on my finger serves a purpose, but it does not tell the whole story of my whole body. Does that make sense? I need it. I'm thankful for it, but it doesn't tell the whole story. I can't cut it off and, and set it at home on the table and expect it to live if it's not connected to the body. If you cut yourself off and say, I don't need you anymore, 
cut your finger off today, put it on your counter, and if you come back next week and that thing is still alive, we need to call the American Journal of Medicine because we've just seen a miracle. It ain't going to happen. In fact, it won't be but just a few minutes before that thing begins to die. It won't be but just a few hours until decay, decay will begin to set in because it's disconnected from the body. You need the church, and the church needs you. The church is where, watch this, where your defeats and your victories are shared. Why? Because the Bible says we bear one another's burdens. I need to tell somebody in the Holy Ghost, you're not alone. The enemy has lied to you and said you're alone. He's trying to isolate you. But I've come to tell you, you've got a church, family that loves you. Hey, let me ask you a question. Raise your hand if this, is, if this applies to you. Has God ever dealt with you to pray for somebody and you didn't know what it was you were praying about? Raise your hand real quick. Now, keep your hands up. I want you to look around the room. Sister Linda, God's woken you up or pressed upon your heart to pray for someone. What if that someone is in this room? What if that someone is sitting here and maybe you felt all alone? Put those hands up again. Look around at what God has done. Could it be that the Lord woke up one of them to pray for you? Could it be that they were going about their day and all of a sudden God said, pray for them? That happens, and I don't mean to sound like I'm bragging. That happens to me all the time. The other day, God spoke to me a word. Man, it came on me so wow and powerful. I was like, hey, Jesus' name. Begin to pray for the person. Type the text to him and send it to him. Told him what God had told me. Responded a few minutes later and said, that's exactly what I needed to hear. You know, sometimes we feel alone and the enemy comes up and says, you're a nothing. You're a this. But I want to remind you of what Pastor Lucas preached a few weeks ago. Who told you you were powerless? Who told you you were alone? The devil is a lie and the father of lies. Somebody needs to realize I'm not alone. I've got a God that will never leave me for, or forsake me. I've got a church family that I can lean on. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. It's where victories, defeats are shared, bearing one another's burdens. When we come together collectively, it's not to be entertained, but rather to entertain the presence of God. And we do this together. Everybody say together. Now, Josh, here we go. Are you ready? Acts 2, 1. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all, in, they were all together, excuse me, in one place. Notice they were all together in one place. Acts 2, 44. And all who believed were together and had all things common. Acts 2.46, and day by day attending the temple together, breaking bread house to house in their homes. They received their food with glad and generous hearts. Acts 4.31, and when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak with the, the word of God with boldness. Acts 5.12. Now, many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles, and they were all together in Solomon's portico. 1 Corinthians 1 and 2. To the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together. You know, some of you are glad, and I hope you're all glad, that the man of God in your life is called to the ministry. I'm not just doing this for a paycheck. I'm not just doing this to fill a void for a few years or months or, or a career or whatever, you know. I'm doing this because I'm divinely called. But don't think I'm the only one called in this place. God calls saints as well to be a part of the church body, to be a part of the family of God. 1 Corinthians 12, 26, if one member suffers, all suffer together. When you're in pain, we feel it, and we'll pray for you, and we'll hold you up, and we'll, we'll pray for you, and, and we'll be there for you. 
If I walk over to Pastor Jack uh, and I take my fist and I punch him as hard as I can in his shoulder, it might leave a bruise, it might hurt, and the rest of his body is also going to feel it and know it and going to want to make sure everything's okay. In fact, other parts of his body might want to defend himself and say, do that again. I'll block it this time, right? It's the same thing when the enemy comes in and he throws a punch. You might be the shoulder that got hit, but the other arm's going to say, Hey, you leave my shoulder alone. The legs are going to jump up and say, Hey, wait a minute, come back here. I ain't done talking to you. You understand what I'm saying? All members suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Ephesians 2, 5. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, God made us alive together. Philippians 1, 27. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. So that whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind striving side by side. The King James there says together. Amen. And my favorite is this. All of these togethers, pray together, worship together, go to church together, you know, uh, miracles together, all these togethers, right? Suffering together, rejoicing together. Isn't that great? But watch this. This is my favorite. 1 Thessalonians 4.17. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together. Amen. So you might as well get used to being together because one of these days we're going to be caught up together. Now, this may sound a little bit negative, so I'm I'm warning you, you know, buckle the seatbelt, tighten a little bit faster there, but tighter, I mean. God does not honor those who withdraw from the community of faith. He honors those who work to edify the body, to encourage fellowship, and to exhibit godliness in his church and in the community. Don't be one that disconnects Be one that stays connected. I need you. You need me. We need each other. All right, number two. Let's talk about revival. The second uh, uh, point there, revival. We got unity, now revival. I've already been yelling and screaming about it because that's the kind of revival I want. But I want you to notice that unity is the prerequisite to revival. These are in order. God gave me these in order, and, and, and they're in order in the Bible. They're in order in, in our text. God, you, you won't have revival without unity. You, you might have a flash in the pan. You might have a little bit of emotionalism, but you won't have true revival unless there's unity. There's got to be that as one man spirit on us in all that we do, and then that revival comes. Now watch what happens here. Nehemiah 8, 1 through 4. And all the people gathered together as one man, right? That's what we got there. Notice they gathered into the square before the water gate. Watch here. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. In other words, uh, bring us the word. Mm -mm. Now watch, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. And he read it from facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday. That was a good long church service. And the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. And watch this, all the ears of the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform that they had made for this purpose. And beside him stood, again, the pastoral team. Now, watch this. The people told Ezra to bring the book. Somebody say, preach it. Somebody say, come on now. How many of you know when Pastor Everett's up here with us on a Sunday morning or Sunday night, he'll say something like this, make it plain. Huh? Some of you might say, amen. Some of you might say, that's good preaching. Some of you just go, mmm, mmm. Well, whatever you're, you know what you're doing right there? You're saying, bring the book. What the people were saying was, preach, man of God. Read the book to us, man of God. We don't want any enticing words. We don't want any psychobabble. Give us the book. Ah, You see, it was a revival for the word of God. They were saying, we want a restoration of a love for the book. Oh, hallelujah. 
he brings it and he reads it in the square by the water gate. And this is significant because if you remember from Nehemiah chapter 3 of the 10 gates that were repaired, the water gate represents the word of God. He is standing at the gate or by the gate that represents the word of God, bringing to the people the book of the law, the word of God. That's revival. They didn't want opinion. They didn't want statistics. They didn't have itching ears only wanting to hear what would tickle their fancy. They wanted the unfiltered, genuine word of God. And may I submit to you, that is a picture of true revival. Notice verse 3. He read it from facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday. In the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law from early morning till midday. They weren't worried about the clock. And please understand, I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't be mindful of time. I get all that. I get schedules and all that. But oh, I long for that spirit that comes on us. That lingering spirit like we felt in the Ironman prayer this morning. That said we know church is about to start. But there's something happened and when we lingered and when those iron men lingered God spoke prophetically to the iron men who were lingering I've come to tell you if you'll linger just a little bit if you'll say God I know I got a schedule I know I got a to-do list but for just a minute I'm going to put it off because I want to hear from you notice it wasn't the presence of men and women and all who could understand this is another reference to unity It wasn't just one group of people. It was all groups of people. And notice all the people were attentive to the book. They weren't daydreaming. They weren't thinking about what they're going to do after service. Come on now. I'm going to tell you this morning that right here is the answer for whatever the question is. You got a financial matter? Go to the book. There's a relationship issue you've got? go to the book. There's an addiction or a bad habit, go to the book. You got a rebellious child, go to the book. You got an unsaved loved one, go to the book. If you're sick, go to the book. Again, fill in the blank. What's your need? Go to the book. The word has the answer. My word has the propensity to fail. I am prone to make mistakes. I am not perfect. But the word never fails. I have the propensity to lie. But God is not a man that he should lie or the son of man that he should change his mind. I can speak words that are not pure. But the Bible says every word of God is pure. Ezra didn't use the platform that he was standing on as an opportunity to share his personal view or give sound bites that would make people just feel good about themselves or some other agenda he might have had. Instead, he just simply read the book. He simply, if you will, preached the word, taught the word. I like using illustrations here and there. They help us to get the picture of what uh, is being taught. Jesus used parables to help the people understand what he was talking about and, and draw that mental picture. But hear me in the Holy Ghost today. Psychobabble, statistics, uh, illustrations, all that fancy other stuff, it ain't going to help you one bit. It might sound good. It might feel good. But I guarantee you by the time you bite into your salad and steak this afternoon, you won't remember what was preached. But if it's the word of God, if it's genuine from the heart of God, if it's more than just a canned sermon, but it's something from the heart of God and the word of God, it'll change you. It'll develop you. It'll help you. It'll give you life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The word of God can cleanse you, heal you, protect you because it's forever settled in heaven. Amen. I'm not here necessarily to help you with your best life now. I'm here to help you get ready for eternal life. (laughs) Oh, the Word of God. (laughs) The Word of God might help you with your life right now. (laughs) But it'll help you with your eternal life. (laughs) Sometimes this cuts. Anybody ever been to a doctor? 
Doctors lie. Nurses lie. They, they come up and they say, this won't hurt. Well, then why are you rubbing anesthetic on my arm? Why are you telling me to look the other way? You know, right? I remember one time I had to get a, a, a shot. I was, when I went to uh, Brazil, I had to get a, I think it was a malaria shot. And I go into the doctor's office and I, I sit down. I got my sleeve rolled up and she comes in. She was an oriental uh, doctor and she goes, oh, no, 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 not the arm. I'm like, oh, she goes, in the buttocks. I'm like, oh, okay. So I, you know, <laughs> she goes, oh, no, pull them down. I'm like, oh. And it, that needle was like this, you know. And I'm like, oh, hallelujah. Oh, this won't hurt. I'm like, yeah, you, you lie. You know, sometimes this hurts because it's a sword that cuts. But, but watch, that needle or the surgeon's knife, the scalpel, while it does cut, while it does initially hurt, its purpose is to heal. There might be a cancer or a tumor or a thing, a foreign object that needs to be removed. Sometimes God comes along and says, I don't like that anger. Let me put you under for just a minute. And the holy anesthetic comes on. And then he says, here, let me cut that out. And it might hurt. And the after surgery might hurt a little bit. But the intent is to heal. Somebody say, bring the book. I want it, Lord. I want it all. Amen. Convict me if that's what it takes. Cleanse me if that's what it takes. I want to be corrected if that's what it takes. I want to be put on the right path if that's what it takes. Don't let my pride stand in the way. No, I need the book. Hallelujah. Now, unity leads to revival, and revival leads to, number three, true worship. Now, again, they're in order. You won't really get to true worship unless there's unity, which leads to revival. And if there's that revival saying, bring the book. God, we want the book. We want it in our lives. We want that word to change. If that happens, that'll lead to true worship. Watch this. Nehemiah 8, 5, and 6. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And again, I pointed out, it's because he was on the platform, not because he was better than them. And he, as he opened it, watch this. As he opened it, what happened? The people stood. So let's try this, all right? Ready? As he opened it, look at this. The pe now, if you ever wonder, you can be seated again. If you ever wonder why sometimes we preachers say, let's stand for the reading of the word, right here is your biblical answer. And as he opened it, the people stood. There was something that came over them that said, it's been almost a hundred years. It's been almost a century since we've heard the law being read from one of the scribes and something came on them. And I can imagine from the front row to the back, all of a sudden something said, I just got to stand in reverence. There's something about the word. I got to stand up and, and worship the word. There was something in them that said, this is not just another ritual. This is worship. Shop. Oh, hallelujah. They stood. Verse 6, and Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And watch this, all the people answered, amen, amen. Lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Listen, this is a Pentecostal apostolic church. There is nothing wrong with you saying amen while the preach is going on. In fact, just as some have bought in with, with money into the word, did you know when you say, are saying amen, you're buying into the word? You're saying, let me be in alignment with it? You're saying, Lord, that word that was just preached, so be it in me. You're coming in agreement and alignment with the word when you say amen. Hallelujah. They said amen. Notice, they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. And notice it wasn't just a few. It doesn't say some of the people. Brother Keith, help me, let me verify here real quick. Uh, you got your book open, you got your Bible, but it's on the screen there. It, does it say some of them? No, 
I don't think it does. You you check yours while I'm looking up here. Notice it says, for he was above all the people, and as were blessed the Lord, a great God, and all the people answered. It doesn't say some. It doesn't say many. It doesn't say a bunch of them. It doesn't say the majority. It says all of them. Again, that true unity uh, uh, led to revival, and that revival kept going, and, and unity kept going as they gathered together, and they said, all of us are saying amen. All of us are saying, God, we want to be in alignment with the word oh what I wouldn't give to hear a resounding amen from the congregation that says God align me with the word align me with your purpose align me with your kingdom I love to praise the Lord and the word praise is used in the Bible nine different Hebrew and Greek words, totaling 427 times. Praise includes such things as lifting up the hands, clapping the hands, singing, oh hallelujah, playing instruments as we did this morning, dancing and leaping and, and shouting. All of these are encompassed in praise. Worship, however, is defined by three different Hebrew and Greek words, totaling 562 times. And it includes bowing and kneeling or laying prostrate before the Lord. Notice the remnant gathered together in unity. They had a revival of desiring the Word of God, and both of those carried over. And the, as one, they all worshiped Him. Wow. Now, let me ask you again, as I did at the beginning of this, how many want that kind of church? I don't just mean breakthrough, revival coming up in a couple of weeks, months. I don't just mean camp meeting. I don't just mean one or two services a year. I mean every time we come together. How many want that kind of unity, revival, true worship experience every time we come to the temple, to the house of God? How many of you want that to spread to your small group? How many of you want that to spread to your Bible study? How many want that in your living room at home? How many want to see that on the street? of Omaha hallelujah now now, if that's not enough then there are results of unity revival and true worship okay now remember those three things are possible because borders and boundaries have been reestablished and that, that unity revival and true worship are the benefits of separation and, and doing that but then these three things lead to something else. Watch this, Nehemiah 8, 7 and 8. <clears throat> also, the pastoral team. Thank you for letting me do that. I, I would not even begin to know these guys' names. You know, the first one kind of Joshua, but after that, wow. Uh, so the pastoral team. <laughs> The Levites helped the people to understand. Notice they helped the people to understand the law. I, I watched something this morning as Pastor Lucas, Pastor Jack, and some others were praying and, and were explaining things. You know what they were doing? They were helping people understand what was going on. That's beautiful. Watch this. They read from the book. They also went through the people reading from the book, the law of God. And watch. They read clearly. And they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. My wife tells me that uh, a lot of times I, I have a habit of saying, does that make sense? And, and she said, you know, you say that a lot, especially when I'm teaching. Now, not so much when I'm preaching, but when I'm teaching, I'll say, does that make sense? And she goes, why do you do that? And I'm like, because I want people to understand. I want them to leave with answers, not questions. I'd rather them leave a life group or a Wednesday night or a Bible study saying, that makes sense, than going, I got 14 more questions here. If, if you're teaching someone and they have more questions than they do answers, you're not doing it right. And I don't mean to be rude. I'm just being honest. you got to give the sense so that the people can understand what is being said. Now watch this. Unity, true revival, or excuse me, revival and true worship lead to two things. Holy structure and clear understanding. The holy structure was that pastoral team, all those names, okay? For us here, myself, Pastor Jack, Pastor Lucas, Pastor Everett, Elder Ruckman, the, 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 the leaders that, that serve, mm -hmm. that's the holy structure. It's the priesthood. 
It's verse 7, helping the people to understand the law. For us in the New Testament, it's the fivefold ministry, equipping the saints to do the work of the ministry. And that brought clear understanding. The priest didn't wax eloquent with, with all kinds of impressive uh, phrases and stuff. No, they just clearly said, this is what it means, da-da-da-da-da. They didn't give out hard words or concepts to be understood. They just made it plain. They spoke clearly so that everyone could understand. That's pretty awesome, isn't it? How many, how many of you want holy structure in the church? How many of you want clear understanding in the church? It'll come because we've built the walls and the borders. It'll come because we've had the gates re reestablished and that separation is there and those lines of demarcation are there. It'll come because we're protected in that and it pleases God. It'll come because it'll lead to unity. It'll lead to true worship, or, uh, revival and it'll lead to true worship which will lead to God's holy structure which will lead to clear understanding. <sighs> if you want that kind of revival, if you want that kind of church, would you just shout amen? Amen. amen? Oh, hallelujah. Clap your hands to the Lord. <laughs> Sister Shannon, First Lady, my beautiful bride, would you come up and tickle the ivories for me? In my key, the key of me. I heard one guy get up and he said, put it in the key of G for Jesus. I'm like, huh? <laughs> Phonetically, they sound the same, but it does, no. Jesus? <laughs> no, it don't work, does it? <laughs> Amen. So wh why have I titled this, Get Your Mind on Jesus, Let's Have Church? Well, first of all, is what God impressed me through prayer, my thoughts as I studied this. Secondly, it was what the remnant did. They had genuine church, unity, true a revival, and true worship. And then as I was studying it and praying, it brought to mind an old song. You ready? All right. You're going to be playing fast, so give me some, give me some. There we go. This, this is what that old song, you coming up for me on the drums? All right. This is what that old song used to say right here. Ready? Get your mind on Jesus. Let's have church. 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 Well, put your hands together. Put both feet on the floor. Let the Holy Ghost ring from the pulpit to the door. Somebody help me sing. Somebody help me sing. 